You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, recorded 6 p.m. on March 17, 2024, presented by Rev. Chris Duke. Well, we're going to read from James chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider these four verses from the epistle of James, the letter of James, We pray, Lord, that you'll speak to our hearts and teach us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A very popular book series that we often encourage our children to read, but is actually probably very good for adults to read, is C.S. Lewis's series, The Chronicles of Narnia. How many of, how many of us have read them? Just, just some? <laughs> okay. So, and if you have read The Chronicles of Narnia, most of you, well, most of you may have seen the recent uh, movies uh, involving that, or recent movie, you know a little bit about what happens. You see, there's Lucy. She's the youngest daughter and she finds this secret land called Narnia when she accidentally passes through the wardrobe and her brother Edmund also wanders in behind her. Now Edmund at this time isn't a very nice boy. At the beginning he's not a very nice boy when this story begins. So he wanders in and he runs into the ruler of Narnia which is the White Witch. And she knows exactly how to get Edmund. She tempts him with his favourite dessert, Turkish Delights. I love Turkish Delights. Who doesn't? Although I don't mind them with chocolate over it and uh, Julie keeps telling me that that's not the way you should eat Turkish Delights. And so Edmund keeps eating his Turkish delights while the white witch is talking to him. And the more he eats, the more he wants. And then he finds himself getting really annoyed when they're all eaten up. And the white witch knows what she's doing. She's tricking him. She's tempting him so that he'll go and get her, uh, his brothers and sisters, so that she can kill them and and she can rule all over Narnia. But here's what Lewis writes at the end of this little episode where Edmund is eating the Turkish delights. He writes, At last the Turkish delight was all finished and Edmund was looking very hard at the empty box and wishing that she, the white witch, would ask him whether he would like some more. The queen knew quite well what he was thinking, for she knew, though Edmund didn't, that this was enchanted Turkish delight. And for anyone who once tasted it, would want more and more of it. And if they were allowed, would go on eating it, until they killed themselves. Now, I personally think all Turkish delights must be enchanted (laughs) because I like eating them more and more. One can never get enough Turkish delights. Now, that last sentence, they would go on eating it until they killed themselves, captures the point of our passage here tonight. 
James is talking to us about desires. And if that thing that you're willing to do, it's that thing that you're willing to do for, to do anything for, other than God. Those desires eventually lead to death. But he has good news for those of us who have wrong and disordered desires. And as our desires are some of the trials that we must deal with. Back in verse 2 in this chapter says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But there's a difference in our passage tonight. That is to blame God and to get angry at God. And so what I want us to see from this passage is that we will either serve our desires or will come to serve God. Therefore, our sinful desires are our number one problem. They're our biggest problem. In verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And James tells us that our natural response when trials comes, when bad things come, uh, happens in our lives, our natural response is to question God. Very rarely do we just run to him and say, thank you, I'm counting this all for joy, dear Lord. No, the first thing we usually ask is why? Why me? And why now? And why does this thing happen to me? Well, it's interesting that it's part of the human condition, isn't it? Every other world religion teaches that if you do enough good, God will reward you. So you do good things. You do good works to put God in your debt, if you like. And therefore you think of God as owing you something. The gospel has nothing to do with this type of thinking. The gospel teaches us that Jesus does all the good that God requires because he himself kept the law perfectly. He never broke the Ten Commandments. And because of his faithfulness and because of his obedience, we go to heaven. And therefore, ultimately, everything turns out well for us. And so if you believe that God owes you something, for the way you live, I've done all this, God. I do all these things. And you might rattle them off in your mind. Now, maybe you've never verbalised this, but you've thought it. I do all this for you, and this is what I get. You owe me, God. And when we fall into this mindset, the moment bad things happen in our lives, we're going to despise God during the trials that come. We're not going to count it all for joy. We're going to blame God. We're going to say, you're a bad God. God, you're not doing your part. You're not playing your part. Well, friends, God cannot be tempted. When we fall into this mindset, We've made God to be just like you and I, just like us. We've made him into an idol. We're worshipping and serving what we want, not what God has for us. We're saying to God, I know better than you in how to run my life. That's what happens every time we get disappointed during trials. And what James does and he's a good pastor here, he doesn't just say, well, stop doing that. You know, if uh, a parent, a good parent would say, you know, pull your head in, in our Australian vernacular. Stop doing that. He points us to why we shouldn't do that. Look what he says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God points us to the character of God. God cannot be tempted by evil and God tempts no one. 
So to turn us away from wrong, the wrong views of God, he recalibrates our vision of God here. So James is telling us that it's far from God ever doing evil to us. It's not even within him to do evil. For God is perfect goodness. He's perfect truth. He's perfect beauty. He can never be charged with doing evil. Never does it enter his mind to do evil. Well, if God cannot be tempted and Jesus is God, was he really tempted when he became a human being? And it tells us in the Gospels that he was tempted. Yes, he's really God and yes, he was tempted. That is correct. But that's not the point of what James is saying here. James is focusing on why God can't be blamed for our trials. God doesn't do bad things to us. He never brings us trials for harm. We need to be clear on that. That's what somebody else is doing over there. They're saying, God is doing this for your harm. And James says, though, that God doing something for your harm can never enter into his character. It doesn't belong in his, in his being. He never sends tests or trials for harm, but only for his wise purposes. So in one verse we can say the essence of true faith, which is what James is so concerned about in this letter, that we trust God's goodness. We trust it so much to be content with what happens in our lives, no matter what happens in our lives. And friends, I know that that's hard to do. When bad things happen, faith holds on to the goodness and the character of God. When bad things happen to you, you hold on to the goodness and the character of God. God cannot be tempted with evil. He himself doesn't tempt us. He doesn't have it in his character to do evil to us. And when life is hard, true faith will grip this knowledge. True faith holds on to who God is and is content with that, even when we don't have all the answers. We just have to trust God for who he is. Now, I want you to notice something else. He says, God never tempts us. God doesn't have any trick questions or, or tests that he sends us. Or, or he doesn't have the trick questions on the test that he sends us. We can begin to think like that, can't we? You're just against me, God. You're doing this. And you almost feel a bit like Job. Are you mocking me, God, with all, that, all of this stuff that you're sending my way? Here's what James says to counter such ideas. God is not against you. He's not trying his hardest to make you fail when he sends a trial or a test your way. God isn't making it difficult for us to trust him. He's not a cunning adversary doing his best to see if we can really stand up. No, when God sends difficulties into our lives, we may never know why. Just like Job didn't. Job never knew really why. But James says, is we have to hold on to. God is not against us and he's, he is good. Everything that God does is wise and holy and perfect and right and you can trust him. That's where James wants us to land in our thinking. The second thing James shows us are the desires we serve. In verse 14 it says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then 15, then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Our problem isn't God. James sets our thinking rightly here. We are the problem. Our hearts, our desires, and that's hard for us to bear. And the gospel will never seem beautiful to you. Jesus will never seem beautiful to you until you come to the point of admitting that the biggest problem you have is inside you. It's our sinful desires 
It's our desires after things that are not of God, that are not even God. Those desires are what lead us astray. It's the Turkish delight dilemma in all of our lives. What do we want more than God? What do we love more than him? Notice the language James uses here. He uses two words, desires and enticed in this, these verses. Now, friends, have you ever gone fishing? Now, fishermen use bait. If they use a rod, they, they have a hook and they put the bait on the hook and they cast it into the water and there the bait is there to allure and entice the fish and the fish comes along and he sees the desire of the food and, and, and endeavours to grab onto it and then, of course, if he takes a bite, he's hooked. He, the hook catches his mouth. And you see, what James is talking about here are the desires that wage war inside of us, in our, in our being, in our hearts, that are constantly seeking to lure us away from Jesus. That's what Satan does with his temptations. But this isn't James' point here. His point is that our own hearts do this. It's not just Satan doing this. It's our own hearts. Desire leads to sin, which if fully conceived leads to death. And this is a profound analysis of the human condition. Desire is the key to understanding why we do and what we do from our everyday behaviour to the most hardest addict. Fundamentally, our lives are a tale of desires. And so our desires, our desires within us reveal our idols, what we worship. But James says, if you walk down the path of desire for anything other than God, your desires become what you live for. So what's the end of that? And then he says, death. Desires lead to sin, which if fully conceived, leads to eternal death. It's an eternal separation from the presence of God's blessings and it awaits judgment. Now, some of us here, there are some here who don't have to do this, but some of us here, in fact, most of you don't have to do, it, do this, have you ever tried to diet? <laughs> I'm always on a diet. It's either trying to lose weight or trying to not be tempted by the food. Have you ever tried to diet? What happens if you try to give up something that you've been indulging in for too long? Let's say sugary things. I love sweet things. Do without it for a few days and the desire comes strong. Well, James says, do not be deceived. Notice how James finishes in verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. What is the root of wrong desire? Well, it's deception. The thing, the object, the idol that causes us to desire is deceiving us. It's telling us that everything is going to be okay, that it will bring comfort, that it will bring us healing and stability and security. It will make all of our dreams come true. And James says, don't fall for it. You're being hunted. You're being enticed. Don't be deceived by it. That's what James is after here. Deceptive desires bewitches our hearts daily. So what do we do about it? James gives us the prescription here. He gives us the medicine here. When we're faced with uh, how often we give into temptations, temptation, temptation presents itself, desires are kindled, and you know you shouldn't, 
be doing whatever it is by sins, little sins, whatever, anything that God tells you, you don't need to be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this, and he tells us that because he loves it, he loves you, he loves us. He tells us this, we shouldn't be doing certain behaviours. And if you're going to go down that road and say, I'm not going to do it, but then you've done it, it can overwhelm you. It can discourage you, even to the point of despair. Yet James reminds you here that you belong to the one, the only one, who's ever perfectly said, thy will be done. Jesus, by faith and by faith alone in him, we are united to the one who says, thy will be done. And that's the only cure for the limitless desires of our hearts, which always should uh, shout at us, my will be done. You see, it's thy will be done, not my will be done. No, you see, friends, we need Jesus, the one who never had unholy desires. Tempted, yes, in every way that we are tempted, but never had unholy desires. God is so much for us that he's willing to go against his son even to the point of the cross. He's willing to go against the one he loved from all eternity and put your sinful desires nailed on that cross, your sinful desires to give you the only way through out of all your sinful desires. You see, the gospel unleashed by faith in your lives is the only way you can begin to see your desires changed. Think about it this way. Do you realise that Jesus is patiently working to woo us back to himself? He's wooing you back to himself and saying, don't be deceived by false lovers. Come back to me because I love you better than anybody else. I love you better than anybody else ever can. Don't be deceived by the passing, fleeting pleasures of sin. Come back to me. The prophet Jeremiah lamented when God revealed to him what's happened to the children of Israel, to his people. People, He says, my people have committed two evils, as we read in Jeremiah 2 verse 13. They've hewn out broken cisterns from themselves that can hold no water, and they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. Jesus says, come back and drink good water. Stop drinking at the troughs of deceptive desire. And you see, Jesus is the only one who can say, if you die to yourself for me, you will truly live. If you crucify your desires that are that are against me, I will be there with you because I did the same thing when I walked on this earth. That's what Jesus says to us here tonight. There are four characteristics of desire. First, what James gives us here, desires reveal that we desperately want control. Let me do my thing and let me have as much control as I have or I can. How does that show up in our lives? The reality is that our desires were never meant to be fulfilled by the things in this life. You see, there's nothing in this life will ever, ever really satisfy. They're only meant to be fulfilled in God himself and by God himself. So every time we legitimately grab onto control, what are our hearts saying? What are our desires saying? They're saying, Jesus isn't actually Lord of my life. I want to be Lord of my life. And here's the good news. Jesus is the only God who willingly divested himself of all the control of the universe. Remember that when he stepped out of eternity and into time and became a, a man, he divested himself of all of the control. But he, he came here to die for our sins. But he then says, you can trust me to control your life. That's how he wins us back to himself. The second sinful desire occurs when we make good things ultimate things 
is a good it, it's a good thing to have a retirement account uh, so they uh, they're telling us you know we call it a super superannuation fund yes but if it becomes what you live for that you can't live without it then it becomes something that's ultimate it becomes a sinful desire what if i lost it right today this moment would that make me seriously consider giving up on life that's where our desires sometimes can go that's what we're functionally worshiping good things become ultimate things and again the only ultimate thing or person who can meet our needs is Jesus. He's the only one who's ultimate enough to take our eyes off this world and have him satisfy our deepest desires. The third thing, what we fear reveals what we desire. So if you fear being poor, you're going to do all that you can to get rich and to stay wealthy and to stay comfortable and to keep the effects of a, of, a, of a poorness out of your life. And that will become an ultimate thing. It will become an idol for you. So what do you fear? What are you most afraid of when you wake up in the morning? What are you doing to control that? Now, fear is certainly a powerful motivating desire. Think about the fear of man. What will you do to get people's approval? If we fear people, if we desperately crave their approval and love their approval more than God, then we'll do things to please them more than doing things to please God. <coughs> the fourth and the last desire reveals what we truly worship. Of course, some of us have seen... Um, uh, I read it years ago, the story of the Lord of the Rings. It's a book that goes on forever and ever, and so did the movies. Um, but at the end of the books, all the films, there's Frodo. He's going to destroy this ring, finally, as he gets onto the top of Mount Doom and he's going to throw it into the, into the lava. And just at that moment, he then says, no. And his friend Sam is saying, please, please, for the survival of all that is good and right and true, destroy the ring. So what happens? Well, the story goes on. Gollum, that changed creature, was once a normal human being who's fishing with his friend when he first comes across the ring and then he kills his friend to get the ring. Desire, desire, desire. Does it, Tolkien gets these verses well and at the end you see Gollum who's become this shriveled up creature, a shell of a being and all he wants is the ring and he finally gets, gets it off Frodo's finger and he's falling with the ring into the lava and the ring falls on his finger and he dies with a smile until it turns to horror when he realises that it is melting. You see, our desires are just like the ring. That's why Tolkien was a keen observer of our culture. They will destroy us. Our desires will destroy us and kill us unless their spell is broken. We would rather die clutching to what we have, to the desires, to the things that we're chasing after, rather than turn to the true and the living God. And the beauty of what James teaches us tonight is that God saves us when we don't desire him. And God is so committed to us that he's willing to do whatever it takes to change our desires, even to the point of death of his own son, in order to change our desires. When our sin nature is dealt with when we come to the cross, and that's why we can go back to the psalmist who wrote uh, Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Can you say that tonight? 
can any of us say that, that tonight? Friends, if you can't say it, that's something to aim for. That's a wonderful goal to have, that we only desire the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the goal, friends. That's where Jesus may be moving you, to desire only him. That's where he wants you to be. You know, he, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. But it comes after you seek Christ first. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you, Lord, that uh, you've given us the Lord Jesus Christ and that he is enough. Lord, we pray that each one of us may desire the Lord Jesus Christ and not the things of this world, that we may desire the friendship and the companionship and the personal relationship with you, God, through your Son, Jesus, more than anything else in this world. May this become the desire of each of our hearts, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church.org.au or wherever you get your podcasts from.